Um, all right, guys, I guess first, firstly, I'd just like to, to thank all of the uh, speakers who came before me. And um, I've used a lot of the stuff that Brendan talked about. I've used SOM, I've used K-means, I've used hierarchical clustering of SOM and all these things. I'm a big fan of all of that stuff, and I really encourage everyone not to think of these methods as being necessarily competitive with one another, but just different ways of approaching different problems. So um, in 40 minutes, I guess we'll find out whether I've interpreted EJ's uh, comment correctly. But what I really want to offer you today is one of those baby steps or maybe some low-hanging fruit. And if you walk out of this talk feeling like um, that didn't seem that hard, Steve, maybe I can go home and have a crack at this tonight, um, then fantastic. That's sort of how I'd like it to be. So what, what I'm actually going to talk about is... Uh, and I've borrowed this term quite shamelessly from uh, Chris Widgens, um, who I think picked the term up at uh, UWA, but it's going to be random forest as an objective auditor of geological maps. So the premise of this being that you've already got some sort of map, um, the confidence associated with it is, well, who knows how good it is and who knows where it is how good it is. Most of the, the um, geologists who made the map can't really even tell you how confident the map is and where it is or is not confident. So what we're basically going to do is remap the map using random forests, allowing quite a large degree of freedom, and just see how that compares to the original map. And along the way, we're going to have a real hard look at uncertainty, because I think that's an important thing to quantify, and also some of the other products we get out of random forests as we go along. And hopefully, as part of that procedure, you'll also get a feel for how the method itself actually works. So. The first bit, introduction to the method. Now, you're going to have heard a lot about this already because most people, again, not knowing exactly who the audience is, have sort of explained these distinctions. So I might gloss over this just a little bit if we've already heard it three or four times, but we'll just go through the methods, how they work, and, and what's the difference. So as many people have said, there's a uh, big distinction here between supervised and unsupervised. Random forests, as I've been using it, is a supervised classification method. That means that we're taking some sort of training sample where we have some a priori knowledge of what the geology, in this case, we're looking at lithology classification, so I'll just point that out very distinctly. If we're looking at regolith, if we're looking at other issues, different data sets will be important, different training data will be important, but this is a lithology classification or a hard rock mapping problem. So you've seen a version of this image in the middle here. This is just the supervised problem. I apologise because it's a bit fuzzy, but the same thing, defining your problem, identifying the correct data. Um, the bit that says data pre-processing, as a geophysicist, I guess I'll just call that my job, but in this sense, it's uh, pre-processing. So we get the data ready, um, we define the training set, select an algorithm. Once again, I'll echo what a few people have said, which is this is one of the less important steps. So that's not to say just use a crap algorithm, but if someone wants to use a random forest or they want to use a support vector machine or they want to charge off into more complex forms of learning. I'm not as fussed about that. By all means, go and have a, have a look at it, but we use random forest. So this is distinct from um, unsupervised clustering, and I think we've heard an awful lot about that, so there's no need for me to echo, echo that. Matt's explained it <coughs> very, very well, and Stephen as well this morning for that matter. So random forest, um, this is a pretty picture, uh, and it's meant to be that way on purpose, so it looks a bit... Um, cluttered, like, oh, there's a lot of them, and they're going off in all sorts of funny directions and doing silly things. That's sort of the point I'm trying to illustrate. So often um, we, we sort of hear about this, and the terms come up today, that machine learning is a bit of a black box. And random forests, um, in the sense that the amount of decisions that go into it are so enormously large that trying to query it would be a very difficult and time-consuming thing to do, it's not really a black box because it's just making simple decisions, splits based on some sort of... Uh, measure of uh, node homogeneity. So you have a node somewhere in your classification tree and you pick a parameter and you split the node into two child nodes based on some sort of cutoff in that parameter and you measure that by something that uh, basically looks at how much you're improving the homogeneity of the child nodes relative to the parent nodes. And what you basically get is a node might say we're going to take potassium and we're going to split on greater than or less than a value and then we're going to go further down the tree and we're going to take the Bouger anomaly and we're going to split on greater than or less than X. And we just keep doing that many, many, many times. Um, and then we add many, many, many trees. But if you dig right into it, it's just heavily nested statistics and there's nothing that magical or black boxy about it. So the idea being that um, in this case, this is called a Pythagorean tree. It's just a representation by our Beck et al. 
And, and all they're trying to show here is basically the little boxes are proportional to the size of the data set remaining at that point. So you can basically see that they're splitting off by various proportions. And the important thing to note is that each tree you see has actually gone off in very different directions. So the reason this is better than a single classifier like a classification tree is that it can actually capture quite a lot of variability and it can also capture nonlinear relationships. So if you've got data that aren't normalised or aren't treated that well, you can sort of overcome some of that because the way that data are classified can go through many, many, many different systems and models to get through a final classification. Um, as Brenton's already said, um, it gives you a final solution which is basically via majority decision. You've got 500 trees in the forest, um, you have 499 vote for one and one vote for something else. It's pretty obvious which class is going to get the nod. But you can also have a situation where 251 trees vote for something and 249 vote for something else. And that's a, that's a very different situation. So you still get a final solution, but you want to uh, you want to sort of look into that a bit further and look at the uncertainty. And that's a, that's a really valuable thing that random forests can do because you get so many solutions and you do get some sort of proportionality. So I know that um, the people who really enjoy... Um, you know, Bayesian statistics and other things hate me using terms like probability. So when I say probability, I'm just saying the number of trees voting for X out of the total number of trees. It's just that, that type of measure. So we've sort of gone through this already, but just to give you an illustration of what I've already said, a simple graphic where you can actually see how a node is being split. You zoom out and see that's part of a larger tree, and you zoom out again and you see that that's actually part of a much larger forest. So we think random forest is actually a fairly strong classifier for this type of problem. Um, it tends to get quite good results and it tends to have um, a fairly good way of dealing with intra-class versus inter-class differences and not having too much trouble sorting that out. And that's a, that's a pretty good thing in the geosciences because often when we see examples from things like signal processing, we see that we've got um, very funny looking uh, non-convex data sets and saying how on earth can we pull them out, k-means won't work because it has to draw straight lines, um, unless we do some very funky things with the data, which is something that um, I encourage you to sort of move towards the big guns, especially up in the back right hand corner of the room, which is um, worth doing, but just for someone again taking the pragmatic approach, just wanting to have a look at these sorts of things, and they, excuse me, they pull up their pretty standard geoscientific data, the problem becomes one of, we plot up let's say a bivariate plot or something like that, and the data all sit on top of each other, except maybe a few outliers over here or over there, and we do it again and we do it again. And we have a lot of data sort of mushed on top of each other, and the question of trying to pull out bizarre looking non-convex shapes that are separated in data space is, is not quite so much the problem we're often dealing with. Rather, we've got lots of classes whose intra-class differences are as large or close to as the inter-class differences, and that's a, that's a big problem. So, at least from what I've um, garnered so far, random forest is relatively insensitive to that, at least compared to sort of competitive uh, algorithms. So I gave a talk on this with more of a focus on this uh, on Tuesday, so I apologise for those who are there. I'm just going to quickly rehash on some of that. But there's a couple of ways you can use random forest to actually rank your input variables, and that's an important thing, as Brenton's already gone through a bit earlier today. Um, random forest is, is relatively insensitive to overfeeding based on feeding in too many additional variables, but it is just a waste of processing time. And again, as geoscientists, you want to sort of interpret what this all means at the back end. So when you get a result, you say, okay, how did it do that? What data did it use? Blah, blah, blah. If you've got 10 variables that you've produced a model with, with 80% accuracy, that is much easier for you to get your head around at the end than a solution that used 600 variables and got very similar accuracy, and, and you've got to work out what that all means. And so just as a purely, again, I'll use this word a lot, a purely pragmatic set, if you can do it with less, even computational power is not so much of an issue here because it's fairly rapid anyway on a modern computer, but when you want to interpret this and work out what's going on and provide that human level of supervision and understanding, that is where the, the less data you can use, the better. So, there's a bit of a sweet spot between two or three dimensions that the human brain has no trouble with, several hundred or thousand dimensions which the human brain just cannot even get anywhere close to dealing with. But if we can get that down to somewhere more reasonable that benefits from a higher dimensional approach but is still something we can reasonably be expected to critique and understand, that's a pretty good place to be. So the metric I use is the one that was actually part of the original publication and that is to 
run permutations of every data set again and again and again and actually just measure what that does to the uh, accuracy of the forest as a whole. So in, in some sense, this is loosely analogous to almost a sensitivity type of metric. So you're looking at a variable that if you change it, it has a quite large effect on the accuracy of the forest versus another variable that if you change that, it doesn't do much to the accuracy of the forest. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to get better or worse, it just means that the change will be quite significant. So we, we want to look at the variables that are most significant to the random forest because we're going to use a random forest to, to classify the data. But if you weren't doing that, if you want to use other metrics um, for other things that aren't related to random forests, again, we already heard about like the mean decrease in Gini index, or even just simple things like looking at like an ANOVA-based approach or a non-parametric ANOVA-based approach to just tell the difference between two of your um, classes and which variables best separate them, then, then so be it. But we're using random forests, so we're going to we're going to go with the ranking mechanism provided by random forests. So, the additional step, and again, I apologise because we've sort of seen this already, but um, in addition to just looking at the uh, sort of sensitivity of the variables, we actually want to do some sort of accuracy check, and that can be a form of cross-validation. In my own work, I've used tenfold cross-validation, but I appreciate you could use others. It's, again, one of the less important uh, issues here, but some means of actually cross-validating. So, showing some sort of... Um, Sorry, I should rephrase that. In addition to the cross-validation itself, you're going to apply this to real data at some point. So if you get a cross-validation result that's very good, it doesn't mean that your predictions on real data or new data is also going to be good. That's a, it's a big leap and it doesn't always happen. But if you get a um, cross-validation result that's terrible and a cross-validation result that's good, well then it's a fair bet to assume that the result that's good is, is going to be the better one to take through and use to classify your data except if you've heavily overfitted your model, which can happen as well, and in fact has happened in one of these case studies. So, <coughs> again, you've actually seen something that looks a bit like this as well, but I just wanted to make more of a, um, a general point with regards to geoscientific application. So we've talked about the steps we take and how important they are, but I'm talking more in terms of uh, code and software and things like that. So I truth be told, couldn't uh, care less whatsoever what software or code you use, as long as it's robust and not, not terrible. But um, this graphic, I've just color-coded by what you sort of need or what you could use to actually run this process. So anything in blue <coughs> is just my way of saying that you can use whatever your company or employer or whatever you work for or who work with or whatever you're comfortable using already, you can just use that. So if your data is already compiled in software package X, then you don't need to go and run this again with something else as long as you can generate it. The stuff that's in green is the same thing. Once you bring these products out and you've done the classification, you've got them as some sort of layer or CSV or some sort of spatially tagged file, then you can plot them up in whatever it is that you like to plot things up in. And I'm not really trying to make any claims about what you should or shouldn't use to do that. If you're an ArcGIS guy, a MapInfo guy, an Oasis Montage guy, Discover, plot it up in that by all means if that's what you can already do. The little step here in orange is just something that means that you will need something that can actually run machine learning code and that might not be a part of standard software. So having said that, it is creeping into a lot of software very, very regularly. So you'll start seeing it in things like IAGAS already. So. Um, yeah, basically you just need to fill this little gap in the middle here with something that can actually run machine learning, but besides that, you can basically use whatever it is you already use and feel comfortable using to produce a lot of the things you need to actually run this exercise. So, I'm going to move on now and talk a little bit about uncertainty. Now, we're, we're using a very specific metric of uncertainty, and I'm not making the case that this is the one you must use, I'm just making the case this is quite a good one. And, when I was sort of going through the process of selecting the metric that I wanted to use, I did actually give some thought about things that people are already familiar with. So anyone who's used Geomodeler will have heard of this before. So um, Florian Wellman and uh, Klaus Ragona Lee put some work out uh, about classifying Geomodeler results and actually getting an uncertainty metric out of that. And they picked information <coughs> entropy. Now, I'm going to say it's not necessarily the be-all and end-all. I think Klaus would actually argue that it is the be-all and end-all. He's very passionate about it, so he's a very intelligent man. I won't, uh, I won't argue with him. He puts my brain to, to shame in a big way. But I'm going to use this so it's just something that's not conflicting with terms that you've already heard, and it's actually consistent with terms that you already use. So that way you can say, oh yeah, okay, 
If I've done geophysical inversion with Intrepid, then I sort of know how this works already, and that's a good thing. So just to go through what we mean by that, a really simple paradigm that we've seen a few times, and once again, this isn't my work, so I have actually put the citations in there. I'm just deliberately trying to fit into paradigms that are already out there. Just a very simple way to think about uncertainty, and again, there's, there's more that goes into this, but just to strip it right down to basics, we have an uncertainty as part of the measurement. That can be some sort of error, basically, in how we actually acquire data. We have some sort of uncertainty associated with interpolation. So what if we, as, as we populate the cells that don't actually have data in them, how have we done that? And the other type would be just simply an uncertainty of um, concept. So do we actually grid smoothly across? Is there a fault that just stops right there on the spot? And we don't necessarily know that, and this one's a big problem for the geosciences because that's the question we have much harder time answering. What is actually going on down there where we don't actually know and we don't actually necessarily have the data? So, again, type, type one, what can we do about that? Well, we can quantify the errors in measurement systems. We can have a, an error bar. We can have a plus minus. We sort of know what's going on there. Interpolation, well, that's a tricky one. Um, and, again, it's just being as uh, robust as possible in how you actually go about it and trying to be rigorous in how you interpolate. Um, and also just the caveat that when you do interpolate, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that uh, that's um, always going to be correct where you have no data because obviously it's not. That's a very obvious source of error where you've actually gridded across a gap and there really could have been anything in between. So that I don't see that as a machine learning problem per se. I see that as just a problem in interpolating in general that we have to address. So the same problems that we deal with as geophysicists or geoscientists we can't really get around that. We still have to, if we want to classify a cell that doesn't have a data point right on top of it, we have to populate it somehow. So conceptual uncertainty, well, the big issue there, I guess, is uh, some sort of objectivity. So how do we actually uh, quantify the uncertainty associated with our decisions? So Random Forest actually gives us a tool to quantify that. Um, the, the big example would be, and I've spoken to a few people in the room about this, you, you ask, um, a certain type of geologist, so how, how confident are you in your map? And he says, I'm 100% confident, I'm sure it's right. We all know that's nonsense. No one can be sure. We don't, he might be right, he might be close to being right, he might be way off, but he might be completely able to quantify his uncertainty anyway, in spite of best intentions. So, being able to be objective about this is actually a really valuable thing, and we'll get to this later, because that's a tool you can use to critique not just the random forest result, but the results that geologists actually come up with. And I should give a shout out to the people at UWA because they've done excellent work on trying to quantify uncertainty associated with manual decision making as well. So certainly look into that if you want to investigate further on this type of issue. <coughs> so we'll skip over that because we've basically talked about it already. But once again, we understand that error in measurements and error in interpolation, they are going to cascade through and end up in the final product if we haven't done them well. So. In order to quantitatively assess uncertainty, we need some sort of measure of what that uncertainty looks like. We've got to pick some way to do it. So a really simple thing could be something as easy as a standard deviation. You know, how, how much does it vary? Something like that. Uh, geological maps, we had a very old-fashioned way of doing that. We could draw a, some sort of uh, dashed versus solid line to say that we're confident or we're not. Um, but we also have a, uh, a, a type of situation where we have multiple geological classes that could potentially occupy the same point in space. So <coughs> we can look at that and the probability of each class actually sitting at each point and we can also try and describe the bulk uncertainty of the system. So we'll look at a way to... So a few ideas of how you might actually go about this, and this is coming from a few different people's work and a few different things. So the first image is from my work, circa 2007, and we used a uh, fuzzy classifier on a 3D model volume of density and susceptibility, and so that was a soft classifier as well. We have some sort of membership to each class. Um, so we have a membership to class one, membership to class two, membership to class three, and that will vary, and the proportions will change at different locations. The example in the middle is actually from, uh, from Florian Wellman's work. It's actually from one of his uh, publications. And that's a 3D model where they use a Monte Carlo approach to 
produce many, many, many different versions of a geophysical inversion and they'll have areas where they overlap and they'll have areas where the model is the same no matter what they do and they'll have areas where they get a slightly different result almost every time they permute the data. That's the paradigm we're going to go with today. But random forests as well, of course, we produce hundreds if not thousands of trees. Each tree comes up with a different answer. So we have a certain proportion of trees in the forest that vote for different things. So we get to say X proportion voted for this, X proportion voted for Y, and so on and so forth. And we get some sort of model of the distribution of prediction probabilities for any given point. So you can use the most if it, if it I don't know if the battery's going on that guy or what? It's coming and going. But yeah. So this is just a uh, another example here. So this is the point to make that class probabilities are useful in isolation. So the final, I like to say final solution, that sounds a bit like Mein Kampf, so I'd rather not go there, but the <coughs> solution that you end up with is a is a is a vote. So the vote can be very close or the vote can be we almost got the same result from every uh, from every um, class and it's a very near thing which one actually got over the line. So there are three examples here. Now one on the <coughs> left again is from my work in 2008. It's a, uh, the probability I think of a magnetic ultramafic class in the three dimensions. The one in the middle is from the St Ives gold mine in West Australia and it's the probability of a particular type of dolerite occurring. And the one on the far right is actually from First Quantum's project in Zambia and that, I think, is the probability of Gabbro. So using these in isolation is not a bad thing to do because, again, you might get a solution out of random forests, but knowing how probable each class was is actually a really, really useful thing to know. And you can actually map off this and define thresholds in other ways other than just which class won the vote. So information entropy, once again, uh, it's a pretty old concept. It's a, it was a very old concept in terms of modern data science, but the modern applications are a bit different. So the reason, the reason, uh, and again, uh, I spent two hours talking to Klaus about this, and he promotes it to me in spite of it being an equation that's only about three terms long. But it's a pretty powerful equation, and it's uncertainty is a loose way to talk about what information entropy is, but it's basically a measure of a disorder of a system. Um, it is termed H. I know the chemists amongst you are going to hate that because that's enthalpy, but that is what it is. I haven't put a typo in there. So what it's basically doing is measuring the disorder of a system. So the idea being that if you have, every, you know, more in a binary sense, one would be as uncertain as the system can possibly be, zero would be as certain as it can possibly be. So 100% probability of one class occurring would be a zero. 50-50 split would be one. As you add terms, you get bigger, so it is a monotonic uh, function. Now, there's a version you just saw before. It was a normalised version of entropy. It's a bit different. It, it expresses like a maximum to, sorry, minimum to maximum range of how certain or uncertain things can potentially be. The way that I'm actually... There we go. The way that I'm actually using this is the way that it was actually um, presented by Klaus and by his uh, students, which is that you actually include a measure of complexity in this as well as just accuracy or inaccuracy in that if you have three equally probable classes that is much, well not much, but it is higher uncertainty than two equally probable classes. So you can have um, that sort of situation where you're actually capturing not just whether a cell is as accurate or inaccurate as it can potentially be, but that even though cell X and cell Y are both as uncertain as they can possibly be, cell Y is actually much more uncertain because it's um, has more competing classes in that location. So this is another example. It's from um, Florian Wellman's work. So um, shout out to him for, for actually you know, implementing this idea. But essentially, it's just a visualisation that's showing you what I've already seen. So you'll have areas where one class is very, very probable, and you'll have uh, areas in the middle where more than one class are possible. And the area where, in this case, uh, three classes are both almost equally probable, you get the highest entropy. You will get areas where two classes are competing but not the third, so you'll get a slightly lower entropy. And you'll get classes where only one thing is present, so your entropy is quite low. And again, from Florian's work, and I hope that um, those of you who have actually used Geomodeler will actually be familiar with this to some extent and the concept won't be too new to you. 
Uh, this is just a 3D example of the same thing. So once again, this isn't uh, controversial new ideas. This is something that's actually in circulation already and we're just typing it for a different uh, purpose. So this is an example of what that might look like. This is uh, from my own work with First Quantum. It's actually not going to press. This was a version that, uh, that got chucked out because the geological map I was working from was superseded mid-project. Was, which was just wonderful, but um, anyway. Um, what we can see here is all the different class membership probabilities for a 12 class problem. And what we can see on the bottom right is the entropy map. And this is actually a normalized entropy map, but the point is um, where you have an area of very high probability in one class, which was the Gabbro up here. You can see that entropy is actually quite low because it's not really competing with anything else. But there's areas down in the middle here where multiple classes were possible, so we ended up with uh, relatively high entropy. Now, we took a look at this as well and said, well, when you look at the sort of true monotonic version of entropy, it doesn't correlate quite as well with prediction accuracy because um, you're introducing that extra level of complexity as well. So you can have a cell that's a 50-50 split and got it wrong, it will have a lower entropy than the cell that might have been a slightly better probability in the scheme of things, but there were many more classes competing. So if we actually strip this back and normalise it by the number of classes present, so now we're looking at a measure of base speed per pixel, how closely it approaches its own minimum and maximum possible uncertainty. And we see that there's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but there is a relationship there with... Uh, with, with inaccurate prediction. And again, we're basing that off a, a map that we've actually used as a control, which, which may have its own inaccuracies, and there's a whole other issue again. But, but effectively, we can see that if we actually use high entropy as a proxy for inaccuracy, we would capture a lot of the inaccurate classifications. And this isn't reliant on a map to test against. This is a product that you just get at the start before you've made your map, potentially, if that's how you were to, to apply it. This one came out a bit terribly on the slides, and I apologise, but um, we're just showing the same thing again. So this is actually a long section taken straight down the middle of the Trident project in Zambia. And what we can see again is where one class is very probable at the expense of everything else, uh, we get a relatively low entropy. So blue is entropy, orange is normalised entropy, and we see that in a couple of cases here. But, but what we also see is we, when we normalise it, we understand that when all the classes are mixed up, we get an error approaching one, but we can see from pre-normalised or monotonic entropy that uh, the problems where more classes are competing in the same location, we're, we're more uncertain. And to use that analogy, that's not quite the way, but that's an easy enough way to think about it. Oh, the, it's actually the, the sensor's on this one. Sorry. So if it's yep. not working, point it back down. Yes, it's not holding it out. So um, getting on to a couple of case studies I've actually put together on this. Um, this is actually, uh, again, we call this the sort of objective <coughs> audit procedure. And the idea being that we take samples from a geological map, allowing the vast majority of the map the freedom to be reclassified as whatever random forest wants to reclassify it as. So, that does rely to some extent on parts of the map being accurate, and the next logical step for this would be to take your samples where there's very high confidence in the map, but we don't always know that, so this is again just quite a pragmatic approach. So what we've done is taking a, uh, the approach actually developed in Crackle et al. 2014 in um, Australian Journal of Earth Sciences, I believe, and taking a spatially balanced random sample from the geological map. Now bear in mind the pixel size is inflated so you can see it, but what we're basically doing is sampling about 2% by ground area of the original geological map, and the remaining 90, uh, sorry, 98% is free to be reclassified as whatever the algorithm wants to reclassify it as. So, in this case, we're looking at an area in West Australia, it's actually at the Sinaias Gold Mine, or to the uh, west of the Junction Gold Mine, for anyone familiar with that area. Uh, if you go six or seven kilometres east, it's a well and truly a brownfields domain, but, but out here you step off a bit of an edge around uh, a couple of kilometres from Junction and there's basically nothing. So 
I'm quite familiar with this area. I collected the gravity data over it in 2010, so I have um, a bit of a feel for what's out there. But basically, no one's really had any look at it in anger. The geological survey has measured some outcrops, and a lot of the map itself just came from an aeromagnetic interpretation. So what we want to see is, can we classify the rock types? But going a bit beyond that, can we get the actual right stratigraphy back out of it again and try and get something useful? Because we've got multiple generations of diorite, multiple generations of basalt, and for those who know the Yulgarn, Proterozoic dikes everywhere, which are petrophysically very similar to um, dolerites, remnant magnetisation notwithstanding. So I um, thought we'd give that a go and see what random forest comes up with, whether it reproduces the result, whether it changes the result. And bearing in mind, I try to use the word consistency rather than accuracy, because when I say it was X percent accurate with respect to the geological map, that implies that the geological map was correct to begin with. And in fact, we don't actually know whether the new prediction is good, the old prediction is good. We actually don't know that. So, input data. So we basically had gravity and derived products. We had magnetics and derived products. Uh, we had the DTM. Uh, that's actually a typo. We did try ASTA, but SRTM ended up being the uh, go-to. The Landsat bands, potassium, thorium, uranium, and total count. And even though they're not in here, there were a number of uh, spatial filters, particularly on the topographic and magnetic data, and um, uh, everyone comes up to this and starts asking about the first vertical derivative, but just bear in mind that essentially we're assigning a machine learning algorithm to work out what data sets it needs to solve the problem that we're giving it, which is a lithological mapping problem. So if it was able to solve the problem better with one data set than the other, that, that might be um, something that, class, that, that clashes with our intuitive knowledge of how we might like to use these data, but that is what it used to, to do the job. So um, lots of things like the uh, curvature, smoothness, roughness, and that sort of thing, they were calculated and they were spat straight back out at me and told that they couldn't really help in, in this case for this problem. So variable input rankings is only <coughs> about the top 15, I think, in this list, but um, the Bougier anomaly was the most important, thorium second, the DTM third, RTP, <coughs> uranium, and then some of the derivatives. So uh, I've shown this work before and I always get asked, that sounds like nonsense, why wouldn't you use the first vertical derivative instead of the RTP or instead of the Bougier anomaly? Um, I should just add the caveat, the Bougier anomaly is a residual, not just the plain Bougier anomaly. And to answer another question, we have actually thought about using inversions as well to actually get a uh, surface volume. And the only reason we haven't done that in these studies is because it's supposed to be a pragmatic approach and I think that's introducing a level of interpretation that may or may not produce a better result. And it would be a step forward that's worth taking, but we just took the data sort of as they were and tried not to introduce any extra interpretation between data and classification. So um, I suspect the reason being in this case why the standard products are more important than their derivatives it's just a question of scale, basically. If you take a look at the first vertical derivative, you'll see that it's mapping um, structural differentiation within lithologies rather than actually picking out one lithology from another. So the first vertical derivative of the magnetics is still your premium tool for actually structural mapping and interpretation, but it can't pick lithologies apart in this case. <laughs> so to see what that looks like, again, the pixels have actually been enlarged, but I've shown it with the map underneath so you can get a feel for what's going on, but what you see on the left of screen is actually what went into the classifier. So anything there that's white space has no label and it can be called whatever the algorithm wants to call it. So it was about 1.4% of the pixels we used for training data. The sample was balanced. That's an important issue in itself and I really don't think it's worth going into right now, but we took a balanced sample. And luckily when we have so much data that doesn't involve any artificial manipulation or imputing or bootstrapping, we could just take the amount of samples we actually needed from each class. So we've got a map that looks like this, and that's a pretty similar map to the original map. Um, so bear in mind, once again, I just can't stress this enough, the original map in its entirety was not used to produce this map, just the data points you see on the uh, left of the screen. So some are more densely sampled than others, and it's quite obvious they'll be able to draw a really easy line around it, like the, uh, the basalt there shown in red. I think that's, that's going to come out of the wash pretty well because we sampled it pretty well. The Paringa basalt, so the uh, bowl of Freud Fall, for those familiar with the area, it comes through right there. So the, oops, the basalts on the, uh, on the right are actually unlabeled, just that they are distinct from each other, one being high magnesium, one being not. 
But again, aeromagnetic interpretation, we don't know this. The one on the left is the perineum basalt, but spatially, it's a very small unit. So the 100 points are obviously pinging at a much higher sample density than a much larger unit. But again, that was just a consideration. Balancing the samples was, uh, was the goal there. So let's take a look at some of the class membership probabilities. We can see, again, forgive the names because they've just called them dollar one, dollar two, because we don't actually know what's what, but we just want to pull them apart. Probabilities of dollar right two, that's the green unit you can see there. And you can see that there's even within the, the area that the algorithm has called dollar right two, there are areas that have very high probabilities, and there are areas that, that just got over the line. Probabilities of, sorry, the uh, header hasn't updated, but that is the probability of the dollar right one, which is the darker green unit in the middle there. And this one, just to show a point of difference. This is the probabilities of the granite on either side. Those probabilities are pretty high and they're pretty consistent. And that's sort of intuitive because you've got a large package of mafic to ultramafic rocks, which are harder to tell apart from one another, bounded by two great big granites on either side. And that's another reason why things like, I think, the gravity and the thorium were pretty highly ranked, is because the first job that Random Forest was able to do was just pull those granites straight out. So that was why they, uh, they ended up at the top. So this is the accuracy map or the inconsistency map, depending on how you want to look at it. So white is where it's the same as the geological map we fed in, and red is where it's different. So the term that often gets um, thrown around, and I credit again UWA for not doing this, um, Accuracy implies that the original map was right and this is how much random forest has got wrong. But where you see red there, what that really means is either the original map or random forest could be wrong and we're not really sure. So not a huge amount of difference has actually happened here, but one important thing is that the, uh, the boundary of this dollar right has actually been moved about 500 metres to the west by random forests. So we ask ourselves, is that, uh, is that nonsense? Has random forest just got it wrong or is it... Um, was the map wrong when the dollar right boundary actually should be adjusted further to the west? So, as it turns out, I don't know if I actually loaded this. No, I did. Never mind. So, I'll come back to that. Um, as it turns out, the behaviour of information entropy as it comes out of random forests or variance, as was the case, we, we have some inclination that it should be increasing towards the logical boundary. So, what we can see here is that where the boundary on the original geological map was, which you probably can't quite see here in blue, but it's right <coughs> there. Um, it's, it's reclassified that just as dollarite, and it's done it with very, very low uncertainty. And then uncertainty starts peaking further out towards the west, where it actually moves to, um, to a random forest classification, uh, sorry, to the uh, granite classification further out. So using that line of evidence, you could actually say, well, that's the way we expect entropy to behave as it approached the boundary. And where the actual boundary was mapped, uncertainty was, was actually very low. So not only has it re-predicted it, but it's done it with relatively high confidence. So it's probably a good gauge that it, uh, that it has actually moved. So <coughs> there's other areas here where you can actually see, um, again, that uh, zones that are quite complex in the classification have come up as being high uncertainty. So if you were going to remap this area, that wouldn't be a bad place to prioritise in the sense that you can have your field geos go out and actually look at the areas that the algorithm had a really hard time dealing with, which means that there's probably something in the data that's very difficult to deal with as well, which is a good place to look into. The other uh, issue I mentioned was the pro result dikes. Now, what you have is a situation where you've got three dollarites and then pro result dikes, which are actually another dollarite, um, now, if you sampled something like a granite with no proterozoic dikes, when you have a great big line of very magnetic dolerite trucking right through it, um, you'd expect that, really, to be classified as a dolerite. That should be a misclassification. But again, because we actually had samples that pinged the granite, that pinged the dolerite, and they pinged proterozoic dikes in the presence of granite, and they pinged proterozoic dikes in the presence of every other unit, we see that Random Forest was actually able to develop a solution where it was able to say, yep, this is granite, this is granite with a pro dike, but it's still granite, and it actually was able to see that. You can see here on the left, though, that um, you are getting slightly higher uncertainty associated with those dikes, but 
that's still made it over the finish line. Now, again, just going back to this image, this is just something that's telling you about the relationship between entropy and inaccurate classification. And on the left, basically you're talking about the relationship between true positives and false positives. And by actually understanding what that relationship looks like, you can actually build in some sort of human drive risk tolerance into how you interpret this model. So how complete do I want my map to be versus how strict do I want to be about not allowing false positives to make it through into the final answer? Five minutes. So the second case study, again, this will be quite similar, so I don't need to explain it, but a, a, a similar exercise, basically. Again, the objective audit of geological maps. Uh, so this was done in the Central African Copper Belt in Zambia. Um, we did a few case studies here trying to use outcrop and numerically balanced outcrop, but we'll just talk about the same procedure again today. Similar data sets, except first quantum had an absolutely superb 46 element ICPMS geochemical survey at three by three, uh, sorry, 300 by 300 metres over an area of basically 70 by 40 kilometres. So that's, um, that's pretty exceptional. Uh, having said that, they say they're going to continue doing that because of what they can do with that data and all those problems about crappy data sets and normalisation, they sort of disappear. So we've still got to fix the old data, but people are starting to say, you know what, let's just be a bit systematic and, and solve the problem at the front end rather than, uh, than trying to fix it after the fact. So good magnetic data, good geochemical data, 100 metre EM data over the same area, very expensive. So this is quite, a, quite an exceptional data set. So, Again, three case studies were trial. We're going to look at case study C. Again, you can see some classes are very tightly spatially constrained, pinged by many samples in the interest of class balance, and some don't have that many. But again, we're talking 2.4% of the geological map. Um, correlated variables, they are either removed or fed in as a single ratio. Variable importance ranking, we went through again. You've seen something that looks exactly like this in Brenton's talk, but once again, uh, the study we're looking at is C3, so we started to top out at around 10 to 12 variables. After that, additional variables were just not worth uh, adding in. They just complicate things for no good reason. So we ended up with a map that looked like that. So again, similar to the original map, but there's some pretty, um, pretty major differences. And I apologize for the colors here, but you'll see the biggest thing that's happened, there are units here, and I don't have a strap column, I apologize for that too, but the unit you can see here in orange, is called the undifferentiated Kundalungu group. The units you can see in dark purple and pink, this pink here, are also units of the Kundalungu group. So what you can see straight away is that a lot of the material originally that was orange, the undifferentiated unit, has actually been repartitioned into more specific subunits of the Kundalungu group. Now, we haven't done ground truthing of this, but these results have all gone back to first quantum, and they're pretty happy that Yep, that, that's probably a very sensible thing to do. We like those results because undifferentiated just means we hadn't bothered putting it in a more specific category yet. So they're quite happy with those results. <coughs> um, consistency with the original map, 68% consistent, although once you address the issue with the Kundalunga group, if you just treat that as one sort of bin, that goes up quite a bit. But it's good to see there's actually quite a lot of uh, inconsistency there. And a lot of the inconsistency here in the eastern side of the map is probably a function of random forests actually getting it right where the original map was not. And some of the stuff further down to the west is probably the opposite. Um, this is just something called a confusion matrix. It's just saying class by class how well things were predicted, but don't, don't worry too much about that. I've got to speed this up. So this is information entropy. The one on the left is the monotonic version I talked about. The one on the right is normalised. So the one on the right, the more orange it is, the more likely it is to be incorrectly classified. On the left, it's a combination of uncertainty, but also complexity. So you can notice that there are zones here in the right-hand side that are potentially incorrect, but they're not necessarily as complex as the pixel next to them. So we get, we get a feel for both. By actually starting with entropy and then normalizing, we get a complexity measure and we get a sort of correlation with inaccuracy measure. So if you were to use that measure on the right, which is your correlation with uh, inaccuracy, this is your normalized entropy, you'll notice that you basically, if you took a reasonable cutoff, you'd have a pretty good idea of which cells you mispredicted. Not a 100% hit rate, but you'd, you'd get a lot of them. So if you took a threshold of say 0.7 or 0.8, you'd capture 70, 80, 85% of the incorrectly classified samples. So that's a, that's a pretty good thing to know when you want to know where have I potentially stuffed this up. So this, 
This product won't necessarily be available to you because you don't know how good your map is, but you will have the one on the left and you'll be able to use that. Um, just to finish it off again, we can see quite clearly that it's not a one-to-one, -one. there is some overlap there, but you are getting distinctly different populations in entropy of classes that were, sorry, samples that were correctly or incorrectly classified. And what you're getting on the bottom, this has actually been normalised, but you can see that as entropy goes up, normalised entropy goes up, your true positives, which are your red, and your false positives, which are your blue. So you can see that for very low entropy, you're getting mostly true positives, you're getting correct answers slipping through, and as you creep up, you get more and more and more false <coughs> positives until you get to a point, and I think it's around 0.78 or thereabouts, your false positive rate actually exceeds your true positive rate. So as an explorer, once again, this is the human part, you can say, do I want to let everything through, knowing full well that a lot of false positives have, have made it over the line, or do I want to be quite aggressive in how I cut this off and only take data that I think have been correctly classified? Having said that, you will be excluding large portions of your map. So it's a question of correctness versus completeness, and by understanding what that curve looks like, the individual explorer can make a choice about how much he actually wants to tolerate that risk or, or not. So. I think I'm pretty much on time now, so if you're under time. I'll finish that up and I'd just like to uh, take the opportunity, of course, to acknowledge the institution for which I'm a part of for another seven days. And I'd like to thank uh, Goldfields and First Quantum for their um, support and their data and also specifically Tim Island, uh, Chris Widgens and Andrew Foley for their, uh, for their support, their provision of data and, and Chris for giving me a fantastic term that I'll shamelessly uh, steal forever forth. So thank you all for your attention and I hope you got something out of this. A couple of questions, Steve? Okay. Let's jump into it. All right, thanks again.